मैन्युफैक्चरिंग एंड डायरेक्टर of the RKT Center for Micro and Nanotechnology at the University of Bradford which is a unique facility focused on manufacturing ultra precision devices using a wide range of polymer based materials a healthy stream of successful projects has allowed the center to build an unmatched capability in terms of both equipment and expertise professor white side has been pushing the boundaries of ultra high precision injection molding since 2001 his application areas include medical devices surgical and diagnostic tools drug delivery systems orthopedic and soft tissue fixation devices from an initial phd study of the mechanical properties of polymer composite materials he has spent over 15 years as a researcher and lecturer specializing in ultra precision polymer manufacturing process His specific areas include computer modeling of polymer processes, high strain rate rheological measurements, process data acquisition systems, high speed imaging or visualizing techniques development and specification of manufacturing systems. for high volume production of polymer components with micro and nano scale features he has actively researched the field of micro injection molding that is micro molding beginning with working at post doctoral level on an eps rc funded project program over the last decade he has built the area considerably by immensely attracting further grant front funding and industrial contracts recently he has developed new processes to provide extra functionality for medical devices including a shape memory effect for cement less fixation and self tightening suture devices and using surface structures for super hydrophobic and anti fouling behaviors he has received the fellowship of higher education academy the cngmi mec e membership status he has published several research papers in reputed peer reviewed journals to name a few Journal of Manufacturing Science and Technology Journal of Applied Polymer Science Journal of Manufacturing Processes Pharmaceutics Materials and Designs Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences Drug Delivery and Translational Research Drug Development Industrial Pharmacy and the list is still elaborate He has written chapters in books Micro Molding Process monitoring and control in micro injection molding 
and introduction to micromolding chapter in precision injection molding. Professor Whiteside will today be speaking on micro needles for drug delivery. May I request you, sir, to deliver your talk? Uh, certainly, yeah. Uh, can I just see the share screen option here? OK, yeah, we've got that now. OK, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes, sir. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you, everybody, for the uh, the invite to give a talk at this uh, at this session. Um, what I'm going to talk to today is just one aspect of the uh, development work we do in our laboratories for ultra precision manufacturing using polymers for the particular application of micro needles for drug delivery. So thank you, uh, Dr. Rita, for a really warm introduction there and a description of me. Uh, this is the outline of what I'm going to present today. So after that rather comprehensive uh, um, presentation about myself, what I'll do is I'll describe in some ways some of our activities in our laboratories in Bradford. And then I'm going to come on to discuss the microneedles themselves. So we're an introduction of the microneedles that we'll be talking about today, different types of microneedle arrays that we can use for different types of drug delivery solutions. I'll look at application techniques for these arrays, so how they're applied through the skin and how the drug is delivered. And then I'm going to come on to some of the focus of my talk, which is which is how we address the manufacturing requirements for these systems. So how do we move from the lab scale into an industrial manufacturing system for making these drug delivery devices in order that they can satisfy their place in the market? So as part of those considerations, we're going to look at the design of microneedles, what materials we should use for these uh, for these uh, devices, uh, manufacturing tooling, and then regulatory aspects as well, such as quality assurance, characterization techniques, and how we can coat and test these devices to make sure that they are suitable for use. So I'm going to skip, skip over this slide because we've already had a, a good introduction about, uh, about myself and my activities. But what some of you may not know, is where we exist in the UK. So the University of Bradford is based in Bradford, which is a city that sits between Leeds and Manchester in the north of the country. And my centre forms part of what's called the Polymer IRC, which is one of the leading polymer science research centres in, in the whole of Europe. In fact, maybe if not the world. So we have extensive laboratory areas and facilities for investigating all aspects of polymer manufacturing processes from fundamental material understandings through to application areas and real real devices. So we actually do manufacturing of real components that go into industry. So within the polymer IRC, we have three individual centres, the Centre for Advanced Materials Engineering, the Centre for Polymer Micro Nanotechnology, which is my centre that I will introduce today, and also we work closely with uh, Professor Anand Paradkar in the Centre for Pharmaceutical Engineering Science, where what we do is we explore the combination of active ingredients with polymer systems for a whole range of drug delivery uh, applications as well. So we've got a really good uh, multidisciplinary uh, capability here that allows us to investigate a whole range of healthcare applications, which I will, uh, I will come on to show. So this is uh, my laboratory. This is the Centre for Polymer Micro and Nanotechnology, where we have a range of laboratories with a focus on developing these ultra precision devices. So we have a range of manufacturing equipment that allows us to produce uh, three dimensional components in a range of different materials with very high accuracy. So we have micro molding and nano molding processes to allow us to do that. We have uh, clean room facilities around all this equipment, which allows us to satisfy uh, medical markets and uh, optical systems uh, design as well, um, because we can minimize uh, the, the intrusion of um, contaminants in the, uh, in the laboratory areas. And we also have our own dedicated material preparation laboratory, so we can work with what would normally be deemed to be hazardous materials as well. So we can look at reactive polymer systems, and we can work with active pharmaceutical ingredients as well. So we can combine those into uh, polymer materials using our preparation laboratory. 
We also occasionally work with nanomaterials as well, which can be hazardous if inhaled. So we can work with those in this dedicated uh, material preparation area as well. And finally, uh, we need to be able to measure the components and the materials and the functionality of the devices that we manufacture. So we have extensive materials and products characterization uh, laboratories as well. So we can look at uh, structure, uh, internal and external. We can look at surface measurements. We look at spectroscopic analysis, uh, a whole range of, of techniques that allow us to, to uh, assess the functionality of the products that we've actually manufactured. So some of the key research areas in our centre, well, we start at the start, which is the, the fundamental polymer science. So understanding uh, the macro molecular behaviour of these polymer materials in our processes, how we can combine them with other uh, ingredients, active pharmaceuticals, plasticizers, in order to find an optimum material property for both processing and the use in, in the in life use as well. So making sure the functionalities are met both for uh, processing in the first place in order to make our components, but then that they satisfy their requirements as, as a useful component uh, down the line. So we work closely with material suppliers, with polymer chemists and polymer physicists to validate models and develop new material combinations to suit specific processes. We also have extensive material characterization techniques, so we can verify the performance of these materials before introducing them into our manufacturing processes. Uh, we can also compound uh, combinations of these materials as well. So we do lots of work in the nanomaterials area, looking at carbon-based nanomaterials such as nanotubes, graphenes, uh, and, and see how uh, we can tune the properties of these materials in different uh, polymer matrices. We do lots of work then uh, now we have these materials on designing production processes that are able to um, benefit or, or give the, the most value to these materials for, for real processes. We find that polymer processing has a significant impact on the, uh, the properties of the final component. So the way in which we actually form these materials into a certain shape can quite dramatically affect the final properties, the mechanical properties, uh, the dissolution behaviours of, of drug systems can all be influenced by how we actually make these things. So we do lots of work on designing optimised processes to get the best out of these materials. So that leads us into new process development, which can be the manufacturing process, but also downstream operations as well. So we look at packaging, assembly, uh, also sterilisation processes, anything we can do to integrate into that production line that means we've got a more reliable manufacturing process that conforms to regulatory requirements. In specific areas, we do lots of work looking at micro and nano uh, structures on surfaces for a variety of functionalities, some of which we'll look at today. We do lots of work uh, to understand further what's happening in the process. So we do lots of work on process analytics. So what measurements can we take from these manufacturing systems to give us uh, an indication of the quality of the process, make sure the process is stable and reliable and repeatable, and therefore also satisfies regulatory requirements. But we use a range of quite uh, advanced methods to do this, including uh, in the image here, we have um, a high speed camera that allows us to record what's happening into these processes at speeds up to 50,000 frames a second. So, so some quite elaborate techniques for understanding how polymers flow during these processes and how our components uh, are manufactured. We do extensive work for uh, product characterization. So looking at uh, surface measurements from the parts we have made, but also assessing the functionality for a whole range of, 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 of requirements and specifications given to us by, by our customers. And then we also do lots of work on other systems that help improve our processes. So our own inspection and handling systems so we can measure parts within the process and are able to sort and filter uh, parts out of the process that don't meet the required specifications. Um, and finally, we do lots of work on virtual engineering of the process. So process modeling, both to optimize part design before we have to prepare tooling for the part, 
uh, and also to, to basically allow us to identify um, windows of operation for our processes where we're going to achieve the highest quality product. So these are some of the polymer processes that we use at Bradford. We have a range of molding systems. So here we're generally using thermoplastics at elevated temperatures in a mold tool um, that we can form uh, with a fairly uh, high um, level of output. So we can have cycle times from four seconds to 30 seconds where we're making components on these systems and then we can send those to our, to our customers for, for, for assembly or, or packaging. So lots of our work is, uh, is fundamentally looking at molding type systems, but we also do lots of work on polymer extrusion, compounding, preparing of drug load materials for a range of, of applications, including implants and, and other forms of, of drug delivery device. We do extensive work on 3D printing at a range of length scales using a variety of systems, including inkjet, fuse deposition modeling, and other uh, UV photo polymer type systems as well for a range of application areas. We have die drawing for building and shape memory effects that I will describe in a, in a few slides time. And we're also looking at other things like um, wound care treatments using electro spinning apparatus as well. So here are just some examples of the kinds of parts that we can make. We can make very high precision mechanical parts. So here we see an 80 tooth gear wheel by the, the this is the nib of a ballpoint pen, just to give you an idea of scale. So with this level of precision, we can also work with diamond machine cavities to produce optical components. So lenses and diffusers for mobile phones are an interesting application area for these. We can work with elastomaterials materials as well. So we do a variety of small scale sealing components for, for a range of industrial partners, as you can see here. So these are on the tips of pencils and these are industrial sealing components for uh, high value liquid handling systems um, where we need the precision and the accuracy that only the micro injection welding technique can, uh, can provide. Uh, we've done lots of work on process design for a whole range of application areas. This was a manufacturer of a bottle cap who worked with us and managed to make significant savings on their production line by reducing the cycle time, so the time taken to make, make each individual part from eight seconds down to four seconds, which managed to have a, a big impact on the productivity. We also do, do work on microfluidics, so looking at mixing systems for a whole range of, of applications for, uh, for uh, testing and lab on a chip type technologies. I've already alluded to the fact we do lots of work on nanocomposites and nanocomposite optimizations for a range of functionalities, including electrical behaviors and obviously improved mechanical performance. Uh, we're doing work now on looking at covert markings down at the micro nanoscale on devices for anti counterfeit technologies. So, what we can do is we can include these kinds of markings at low cost into existing supply chains and they're then able to act as indicators of, uh, of counterfeit goods in, the, in that supply chain. And other things as well, we make recycled products. So here we're making uh, an artificial wood consisting of purely industrial waste. So waste polymer and waste, um, waste uh, materials, so hard materials to create artificial wood products for use in, in homes uh, worldwide. But the main driving force for lots of our application areas recently has been for healthcare applications. We've been looking at uh, developing uh, medical devices in a whole range of sectors from implants, uh, drug, div drug delivery devices, surgical tools, diagnostic tools. This has been a real driver for lots of our activities in the, in the lab over the, the past 10 years or so. So some applications here. Uh, we do lots of work uh, for dentistry applications, so uh, various sort of brackets uh, for teeth. We can make molded versions of those. And this at the bottom here is an example of um, a root um, canal filling treatment. Basically, we worked quite closely with a local company to develop a new method of uh, performing a root canal filling operation with a material that has a much better outcomes from a patient than existing technologies. So it took a long time to get the material uh, right for the manufacturing process for this particular product. But after time, we went to full production and we saw significant benefits in the, uh, 
in the dental arena for, for root canal filling treatments. We've also worked to develop coronary stents. So we have a special process at Bradford where basically we can impart a large load uh, during the manufacture of these tubes, which they can then be laser cut. And what this deformation does during processing is it builds in a shape memory effect so they can be used as coronary stents uh, for, for heart operations. So when placed inside the human body at 37 degrees, this component here will actually try and revert back to a larger diameter tube, which means it basically opens the vessel which had the blockage. So basically it can actually uh, improve the, uh, the performance of the, of the vessel in the heart. And over time, this is a bioabsorbable material, so this will be absorbed by the body so it doesn't leave um, a lasting scaffold, which could require removal by surgery at a later date, as with existing metal stent technologies. Other things we're looking at are shape memory fixations for other um, tendons and ligaments onto bones. So for rotator cuff repair, which is on your shoulder, or for anterior crucial ligament repair, we're doing lots of work looking at developing shape memory materials that have an automatic locking feature that provides a more rigid and structural uh, fixation into the bone, which is looking promising. And finally, this is an example of what we did in the micro area where we created a product for packing of collapsed vertebrae. So the beads that you see here on this chain are only three millimeters in diameter and there's an octagonal uh, facet structure on here to enable the uh, packing density to match that required. And these are all injection molded onto a filament uh, in, in numbers of 52 per, per chain. So these can go into a dispenser gun used by the surgeon to apply these directly to, to the location for packing uh, collapsed vertebrae. So this is a very high value polymer. This is an implantable grade peak with a radio opaque filler, um, which is a very high value polymer. Um, and obviously this needed, as it was uh, an implantable device, we needed to conform quite rigidly with regulatory requirements in terms of the process cleanliness, process monitoring and sterilization for this particular application. But one really big area that we've seen over the last 10 years is a demand from industry and uh, pharmaceutical partners looking at microneedles as drug delivery solutions. So first of all, I'm going to explain what a microneedle device or a microneedle array device looks like and why it's um, an important device looking at the future of drug delivery. So let's look at what a microneedle device is, first of all. So a microneedle device is a device that consists of rather than a single needle that we use for an intramuscular or intravenous injection, we have an array of much smaller needles, so a much higher number of smaller needles. And these needles are typically only 0.4 to 1 millimeter in length. So they penetrate uh, much uh, less deeply into the skin than a standard uh, hypodermic syringe. And the reason why we take this approach is because um, these needles are long enough to break through the stratum corneum and penetrate into the viable epidermis, but they don't penetrate significantly into the dermis where we have our nerve fibers and, and larger blood vessels. So the advantage here is basically we're not penetrating penetrating so deeply as to feel pain um, and we're also making lots of smaller holes compared to the very large hole that is created or comparatively large hole that is created with a hypodermic needle um, and so this is quite an effective way of getting drugs through that barrier uh, of the stratum corneum so you're getting it into uh, into a vascular system uh, by avoiding the, the barrier properties of that external layer or the uppermost layer of your skin. Now, it doesn't just have to be used for drug delivery. Uh, we have seen applications of microneedle technologies for sensing in the body as well. By putting electrodes onto these needle arrays, we can create very, very sensitive sensors for monitoring a whole range of, of uh, elements in, in the body for a range of different kind of health monitoring uh, type applications as well. But the focus in the talk today mainly on these uh, drug delivery applications. 
So why is it important? Well, we've actually seen a big surge in uh, articles in the news describing these, these microneedle arrays. And one big driver of that is due to the fact that microneedles are very effective for vaccine delivery. So there's been all sorts of, of applications or, 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 or articles in the research area looking at using these kinds of microneedle patches for delivering vaccines. Obviously, uh, the most important at the moment is the COVID-19 vaccine as well. So there's lots of work looking at using microneedle arrays as viable uh, delivery mechanisms for vaccines for coronavirus type uh, type, type uh, diseases or syndromes. And the reason for this is simply because um, one of the main advantages of a microneedle patch is it can be administered a little bit like a nicotine patch, i.e. you don't need a trained professional uh, to deliver the system. So basically the vaccine or the huge vaccine rollout programs that we've seen happening worldwide could be accelerated by giving people the opportunity of applying their own vaccine rather than having to rely on a, on a hypodermic intramuscular injection by a trained professional. So the ability to actually post these to people or send these out to people uh, so they can self-administer is very, very attractive when we're looking at high volume vaccination programs like the one that we've seen worldwide recently. And so it's the biggest vaccination program in history by some margin. And microneedles offer a really good opportunity for addressing the limitations of that kind of program in, in future. And I'll come on to explain more about that in the next slides. But uh, but it's not just about vaccinations. These are also looking like really good vehicles for a whole range of therapies and treatments for a whole range of conditions. So even though the technology itself has been around for maybe sort of 18 or 20 years now, we're starting to see some, some big pharma applications coming through using this technology. The regulatory bodies uh, are much more comfortable with microneedle technologies. So it's looking like we're on the cusp of seeing a whole range of, of different application areas. So why bother? What, what, what are the benefits of using these microneedle technologies over and above these really sort of like safe existing systems that we have in the marketplace today? Um, tablets, hypodermic injections and transdermal patches are tried and tested techniques that we've been using for, for many years for a whole range of treatments. So if we do move to a microneedle array and have to jump through all the regulatory hoops that come with bringing a new, a completely new uh, technology into the marketplace, what are the benefits that sell this technology that allow it to be used uh, over and above these existing, um, these existing routes for medication? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the benefits of microneedles relative to each one of these individual uh, application technologies. So first of all, let's look at microneedles versus oral delivery solutions, so capsules and tablets. Well, one of the main benefits we have with microneedles is that that we get with hypodermic injections. It, obviously, it avoids this first pass metabolism of your liver. Uh, which means that you you miss you, know, you you avoid that immediate absorption of your dose of active material, which removes or reduces the level of drug that actually um, reaches the 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 area or the uh, the area of activity where you require it. So what that means is obviously by avoiding that first pass, we're getting effectively a higher drug efficacy uh, by using the the microneedle uh, dosage system which means we need a lower overall dose requirement and a lower overall level of active pharmaceutical ingredient. And there's also obviously a reduced liver burden for absorption of these materials there as well. Another benefit is obviously we can apply the microneedle treatment directly to the affected site as well. So if you have um, a particular location in the body that leads a particular treatment, by applying the microneedle treatment in that area, you are once again targeting that site even more effectively. So once again, you get the same benefits of a higher efficacy and a lower dose requirement for that particular area. Another benefit as well is you get much easier access to uh, the systems just under that top layer of skin. So it's much easier to get treatments to uh, lymphatic systems because it's more readily uh, absorbed 
um, at these sites rather than through oral delivery. And we also get a much better immune response for things like uh, vaccines and antigens, simply because um, most of your kind of immuno uh, machinery sits just in that top layer of skin as well. So we, we generally get a much better immune response for things like uh, vaccinations by, by delivering it to these kinds of areas. And the other one as well is it's obviously going to be faster acting because we're getting it straight to the area and into the uh, into the, the, the system um, faster than you would get through an oral delivery. So, so the benefits, even though uh, tablets are very cost effective and very easy for people to take, there are some significant benefits uh, that microneedles offer in a similar way to, to hypodermic type, uh, type injections. So let's move on to that. What are the benefits that we have for microneedles over hypodermic injections? Well, one of the main ones is by having lots of smaller needles instead of one big needle is that we create lots of smaller holes which here which heal uh, much more rapidly than hypodermic injections so the puncture holes themselves will close to a point where they're almost uh, indetectable in just 15 to 20 minutes we're also penetrating less deeply uh, through the skin as well and there's less uh, microbial penetration so there's less chance of infection uh, using these these microneedle devices because we're making a, a smaller smaller wound um, or a smaller set of wounds in, in the body. There's also a reduced chance of reaction as well because we're doing less damage to the to the local area. So so generally we're, we're doing less harm to the to the skin and we're, we're seeing much more uh, much faster uh, recovery times. Um, there's once again an improved immune response over intramuscular injections once again because we're putting it into the area where we have all that uh, all that kind of immune machinery uh, we're putting it into uh, a location where we get a really good uh, sort of cascade response when we when we put vaccines in the area but one of the main ones when comparing these two is that people don't like needles people don't like needles because they hurt and some people don't like needles just because they're needles they're they're a slightly uh, off-putting or daunting uh, prospect for many people who need vaccinations or injections. So by moving to a microneedle device, which people associate more with a kind of patch type technology, um, we get pain-free injection and you immediately remove that kind of needle fear, mainly because you can't actually see the needles. Uh, with, a, with a syringe, it's clear, you can see that long needle there that's going to go in your arm. Many microneedle patches uh, the needles themselves are quite difficult to see, so you don't actually see or have that fear of a needle-based injection. And another really big one is the ease of administration. Much of the vaccine rollout pro well, the vaccine rollout vaccine rollout program in the UK was dependent on two things. One was the availability of the vaccines to deliver to the population. And the second one was availability of trained healthcare professionals to administer the vaccine. So basically, if we move to a patch-based system, we don't need this trained healthcare staff requirement, um, which is one significant benefit of, of the microneedle technologies. So basically, if they're easy to administer, you can self-administer and remove that, that requirement. Another really important one is if we can prepare sort of dried versions of these vaccines for delivery using the patches then by not having to have it in its liquid form in the files we can remove um, the cold chain requirement as well so basically we don't need to keep these things at very very low temperatures in our supply chains to ensure the vaccines reach um, reach their, uh, their, their 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 sites unharmed so basically we can we can look for dry solutions using these kinds of technologies so some significant benefits, particularly over hypodermic injections. But you can argue as well, uh, well, in that case, we already have uh, pain free uh, ability to deliver drug molecules at site. Um, so why do we need microneedle devices over the existing transdermal patches? Well, the main thing here is the fact that if you're using transdermal patches, you can only deliver very small molecule uh, drugs. The stratum corneum is a very effective barrier layer uh, that restricts and hinders the, um, uh, the, the, the absorption of anything larger than, than, than small molecule drugs. So basically, if we have a microneedle patch, we've penetrated that upper area at that upper layer, 
so we can basically deliver large molecules. So when we're looking at the whole range of different therapeutic drugs that we want to deliver, um, then just by using a patch technique, you would be severely restricted in, in what you could deliver, whereas microneedle technologies allow a much larger range of drugs to be delivered. Um, by penetrating through the skin as well, we're also giving ourselves more control over the diffusion of the drugs into the skin, so we get better dosage control, and we can also get a better rate of delivery control as well using microneedle-based devices. So we've seen there are significant benefits uh, for the uh, for the technologies over all three of these delivery systems. So it's a, it's, it's a promising it's a promising area. So now let's look at different ways that we can use these devices to actually deliver our drugs to the intended area. So we're going to look at three. Uh, well, so we're going to look at uh, five different types of microneedle uh, microneedle structures, basically. So the, the, the types we're going to look at here are hollow microneedle arrays, which are basically analogous to um, a large number of hypodermic syringes, but on just a smaller length scale. Um, then what's called a kind of poke and patch technique, where we're using solid microneedles to penetrate the skin and then applying a topical treatment. We'll look at dissolvable microneedles in detail, where we allow the needles to, to dissolve in the skin. Coated systems, where we put coatings on the tips of the needles. And finally, hydrogel-based systems. So starting the first one, hollow microneedle arrays. So these are the ones that are more closely related to the existing uh, hypodermic type systems. So the advantages of hollow microneedles are as they are for those other systems. We can provide quite a high drug payload using pressure driven and capillary flows down these devices. So effectively, we have a reservoir of our active pharmaceutical uh, at the back of the microneedle array and we can use pressure to, to force that, that active through each of the uh, lumen in each of the needles into the area beneath the skin. And the advantage of this is we're gonna have good dosing accuracy and we can also deliver it over fairly short time periods because we're not waiting too long for molecules to diffuse or, or, or things to dissolve. So it offers all sorts of benefits uh, from that, that point of view. The disadvantages of hollow microneedles is that they do require quite complex uh, manufacturing techniques. It, it places quite significant demands on the tooling and the, um, the, the, the technology required to develop these kinds of structures on such small, small uh, components or small features. Because bear in mind, each of these microneedles has a base that's maybe a quarter of a millimeter in size. So to then put a hole through that and have a, an access port at the end of that of that channel becomes quite challenging from a manufacturing point of view. Um, so some examples that we have here on the left, we have um, one of our partners at um, Cardiff University in the UK created this uh, using a compression injection molding technique. So this has uh, two, two entrances to a hollow core on either side of the needle, then a hollow channel going back to the base plate that allows uh, drug delivery down, down that system. And also you can see here there's a sharp point at the end to aid penetration behaviour. Uh, we also have um, a much more fragile hollow microneedle here. And this takes me on to one of the, the next problems sometimes with hollow systems is that by creating the lumen or the hole through the part, that leaves very, very thin walled sections and they can be uh, subject to fracture or buckling during insertion of the microneedle device. So we have to be very, very careful to maximize the wall sections where the stresses are going to be incurred during microneedle uh, injection or penetration of the skin um, in order that the device is going to function. Because if these needles buckle or collapse, then that's going to hinder the application of the drug through the centre of the needle. Um, but also it can influence the actual manufacturing stage of the process as well, because if your wall sections are too thin, you need quite a high uh, driving pressure in order to, to drive the polymer into that, that, that mould tool to, to create your structure in the first place. So here's an example from our own labs of a complex uh, hollow microneedle system, where if you don't have sufficient injection pressure, then you won't be able to actually force the material into these thin wall sections 
and we see uh, a poor quality replication. So there's lots of challenges associated with hollow microneedles, uh, particularly also when they go into the skin, they're more subject to kind of blocking and plugging, which, which once again restricts the, 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 the drug that you can distribute in there. Um, so even though they were a strong contender in the early days of microneedle technologies, they've kind of taken a little bit of a backseat recently just because of this added complexity and the problems with use. A much more simpler way to uh, administer the drug is to use almost a combination of the old transdermal patch technique and a microinjection, uh, sorry, and the microneedle patch. So basically the way this system works is we take one patch and we use that to penetrate this outer layer of skin, the stratum corneum, and creates these small channels going into our epidermis. And then we can apply a topical treatment like a cream uh, or, or, a, or a liquid onto the surface of the skin. And that's then able to flow through those holes uh, and diffuse into the into the underlying layers and administer your dose. Or what you could do is you could have a dissolvable patch or a transdermal patch as well that you just stick over the holes that you created and you get a similar diffusion of that active pharmaceutical ingredient. So it's a really, really simple approach. And the advantage of, of, uh, of doing this is that we have very simple tooling geometries that we create for our manufacturing processes. So these are going to be lower cost than some of the more complex ones we've seen for the hollow systems. It also gives us the opportunity to explore a wide range of material choices. It, the, this, the, the material used here um, doesn't really affect any of the drug delivery aspects of, of the, the process. It's all purely geometry defined. So what we can do is we can really optimize the materials we use here to get the best possible mechanical properties to ensure we get really good penetration behavior and we don't get any breakage of needles as well. Um, we can also use the same microneedle design for any particular topical application. The, the drug we use doesn't particularly matter in this case as long as we get good uh, diffusion through the, hole, the pores that are, foam, that, that are formed by the system. So we can use a range of, of, uh, of different topical treatments with the same microneedle design, depending on the location of the body uh, for, for what, what size needles you've used, I guess. The disadvantage of it is it's a two-stage approach. So you've got to do one procedure, then the next, which some people don't like. And it also can be quite an inefficient use of the active material as well. It's difficult to make sure that all the material passes through the pores because it can't. If you just apply it to an area of skin, the pores themselves only constitute a certain uh, percentage of that area. So you've got active that's kind of wasted on the surface of the skin. And that also means that you start to get problems with accurate dosage control using these systems as well, because it all depends on the contact and the, the application of the topical uh, material uh, on there as well. So these are all problems that work against the poke and patch technology. Um, so where can we go to next? Well, how about um, a, a combination of the two? What we want is something that dissolves into the skin, contains the active ingredient, uh, but we can do in one go. And that's where dissolvable microneedles come in. So here we'll have like a rigid back plate and we have our drug is actually mixed with a dissolvable polymer system that dissolves inside the skin. The, 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 sort of the, the aqueous environment and the temperature can be used as triggers to cause this dissolution of the polymer that contains the drug. So basically what happens over time is that the polymer will be absorbed uh, or dissolves into the body and it's carried away and the drug is then released into that, into that affected area. So over time, those materials will either dissolve to nothing and then the backing can be removed. Uh, you can actually engineer um, sort of weaknesses at, the, at the, the union between the dissolvable microneedles and the backing plate. So you can actually remove the backing plate and leave the dissolvable uh, needles in the skin. So they can dissolve over any period of time from uh, just a few hours up to numbers of months if required for a whole range of delivery applications. Um, and and it's just uh, and you get very good um, dosage control as well because as long as the material or the needle uh, or each needle in the array penetrates the skin and is absorbed by the skin in that region, then you tend to get really good uh, really good dosage control. Um, 
So this allows us to play around with lots of different uh, material and API combinations. So by careful material selection and design of how we combine that with our API using co-crystal systems or solid suspensions, then we can start to be able to control the release rates in our uh, in, in our uh, in our microneedle systems. We can also dose higher than coated systems that I'll come and show in a bit as well, because we're using the whole volume of the microneedle to contain our drug which means we get quite a, a nice high dosage into the into the relevant area. The downsides of this are we can't choose a material that gives us the optimum penetration performance because we're bound to use um, dissolvable polymers. And typically those dissolvable polymers won't have as good mechanical properties as some of the, the higher quality engineering thermoplastics. So we might have a softer needle uh, that's more likely to bend, which gives us slightly poorer penetration behavior. We also have to be aware that the polymer part of this uh, polymer and active ingredient mixture is going to be absorbed by the body. So we have to make sure that the body itself can break down that polymer material and excrete it from the body without it getting getting kind of caught up anywhere or, or, or absorbed by the body where we don't want it. Uh, and once again, with the dissolved microneedles, it's going to give us a slightly more complicated uh, manufacturing approach to make these things in the first place. But they're a, they're a good solution for a whole range of, of application areas. So the next one is, can we bring the benefits of the dissolvable systems, but with the mechanical properties of the engineering polymers? So can we have a nice rigid uh, polymer that then contains a dissolvable element that, that allows it to go into the body? And that's where coated microneedles come in. So here we can have um, a rigid polymer system that isn't uh, absorbable by the body and what we can do is we can coat onto the tip of that our active ingredient for introduction into the body so we've got some examples here of where this is actually um, a polymer based microneedle again that's been dip coated to give this 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 coating on the, on the tip of the needle as well so once again as long as our coating process is robust and repeatable uh, then we can get good control of the dosing into the skin we can get high quality of delivery of the, the active ingredient in these layers into the skin. As I said before, we can select a support material, so mechanical properties of this material can be chosen to provide uh, good mechanical behavior and good penetration behavior into the skin. And also, it's pretty low cost manufacturing. We can mass produce the, uh, the microneedle array. Dip coating systems are fairly straightforward to, to actually coat these needles, um, and that gives us a fairly low cost manufacturing chain to make the to make the devices in the first place. The slight downsides are, as you can see, if you've got a sharp tip and then you place it into a coating, that's going to slightly reduce the tip sharpness, which is going to impact your penetration behavior slightly. Uh, but one of the main limitations with the coating techniques is when you consider the amount of drug that you can apply onto an array. It's only forming a small volume on the tip of the needle here. So sometimes for drugs that need quite a high payload, to be effective, then that can be an issue in that you need quite large microneedles array, so large dense microneedle arrays in order to administer the amount of drug that is required. And lastly, but not least, we have hydrogel microneedles. So hydrogel microneedles are very similar in some ways to the uh, dissolvable microneedles, apart from the fact they don't dissolve. So basically a hydrogel microneedle consists of a hydrogel that contains your, your drug, your active pharmaceutical ingredient. And when that is placed into the skin, the hydrogel will absorb moisture from the area, water from the area, it will swell. And the swelling of that hydrogel dramatically improves the diffusion uh, of materials through that, through that hydrogel. So the drug that was effectively trapped in there before in its dried state becomes able to diffuse out of the hydrogel into the local area in the skin. So basically, as soon as that's been activated, the drug can diffuse out. And then once that procedure or that process has happened, the hydrogel microneedle can be removed from the skin. So the benefits to the hydrogel microneedle are very similar in some ways to the uh, absorbable uh, microneedle devices. But the, the big benefit here is that you don't have to worry about that polymer being absorbed into the body because the polymer itself doesn't decay, it just releases the active pharmaceutical ingredient um, and then you remove the hydrogel 
following the application. So that's the big selling point for hydrogel microneedles. The downsides are hydrogels aren't particularly good in terms of their mechanical properties for, for penetration behavior. And they're slightly more difficult to form using the, uh, the molding techniques as well. But generally, the benefits for hydrogel microneedles look, look pretty good. OK, so they're the main microneedle designs that we're, uh, that, we're, that we're going to be looking at. However, once we've done or once we've settled on a particular uh, microneedle approach, for delivering the active pharmaceutical ingredient that we intend to use for our, for our given treatment, we then have to consider how that microneedle will actually be applied to the skin. And this is a big, a big issue that's facing uh, the microneedle research community at the moment, is the best way to, to apply these, these arrays to the skin. Because uh, the whole, uh, one of the main selling points of microneedle patches is that they're designed to be self-administered. Um, but this poses challenges when you consider that regulatory bodies require consistency of delivery for them to actually approve a device for use. So you're kind of at the mercy of your end user to be able to use your device the same way as everybody else and in a very uh, controlled and uh, and deliberate way. That means that there's no chance for a dosage to be under or over that that's been, been predicted by the manufacturer. So in effect, we need to divide, design, design the microneedle device in such an order that any variation in the dose due to uh, improper use is minimized. And so we have to think about how these devices are applied, how people could use them incorrectly, and making sure we take measures to remove the, the, the opportunity for these to be, to be used in the wrong way. And this is a key challenge for, for microneedle devices, particularly when you consider microneedle patches are small, flexible uh, type, type components. It's not easy for you as a human to actually apply a constant pressure over the whole area of that patch in order that you get good penetration across the whole patch. So let's look at devices uh, that we could use. Um, so one of the earliest microneedle devices was actually used for cosmetic applications. So it was used to promote skin repair for scar tissue in a, a range of applications. So we had examples like the derma roller, which consists of these roller structures with needle projections coming from them, and you effectively just roll it over effect over the uh, over the area that required treatment. So it's a nice technique. Um, it, it has good results. You can apply a good pressure and cover areas fairly readily and uniformly. However, they're not really useful for drug delivery as you've got each needle providing multiple penetrations. You've got no idea how long each needle has been in the skin. So you don't really get the control uh, you require for a proper controlled release drug application. So it's probably best not to look at these devices in particular for, for inspiration. <clears throat> So much more common are patch applicators of different uh, complexities. Um, as I said before, applying a patch is actually quite difficult because the human hand doesn't com conform particularly well to other areas of the body. So you can't really easily administer a uniform pressure over the patch to ensure you get, uh, you get a good delivery. Um, so what people are doing is looking at different ways to actually improve the pressure that's applied and improve the quality of the delivery. And this can be do, done in a couple of different ways. One is we can actually put um, materials on the back of a patch to indicate using colour or even using air bubbles that pop, so an audible uh, feedback that tells you that you've applied the right pressure. So you can get things like photosensitive dyes that turn a certain colour when you've applied the right pressure. So if somebody looks at the colour of a patch and makes sure that the whole patch is a uniform colour that indicates that the drug has been delivered correctly, then that might be that might be one way forward. However, many people prefer the use of an actual applicator design itself. So, so something like we see on the right hand side here, which is a, a, a polymer based uh, instrument that has the micro needle patch contained within it. And that can be used to, to press down onto the skin. It will make a clicking noise to tell you that the, the, the penetration has occurred and some kind of visual indicator that everything has worked okay. So this 
there's, there's different uh, levels of applicator device here. Some, obviously, the more complicated ones will have a higher cost and maybe not viable for the marketplace for, for particular applications. But for those where you require very, very accurate dosing for particular conditions with particular, um, particularly uh, strong drugs, then, then an applicator like that might be the way to go. But there's lots of research going on into looking at simple applicator designs, giving the feedback to the patient that they have worked and delivered the dose okay. Right, so basically this comes to uh, this comes back to we've defined the microneedle technology. Um, we as um, precision polymer processors able to make new processes to create new new devices uh, were first approached ten years ago to address this particular problem with with microneedle manufacturing. How can we take uh, what we know in terms of our polymer processing capability and how can we apply that? to make sure that we can make cost-effective uh, microneedle devices in high volumes. We need to make, if you imagine, we need to roll out these devices for something in the future that looks like a COVID-19 vaccination program. We need to make really high volumes of these in a really short amount of time. And that's why people approached us to look at existing manufacturing techniques and try and work out what we can provide the quality, uh, the, the, the high level output, and the consistency of products that the market would require. So let's have a look at different ways that we can manufacture these microneedle devices. So the first one we're going to look at is silicon micro machining. So this was one of the uh, the first methods that was looked at in detail for making these devices when they were first proposed, say 20 years ago. Silicon micro machining was uh, was very popular then. It's used for MEMS devices, uh, various of electrical systems, and there was a good understanding of how you could create a uh, very kind of um, accurate planar uh, or, or shapes or, or shapes or upstanding shapes with with planar facets on that using existing silicon micro machining techniques. So we can. See on the right hand side here, we've got a couple of examples using uh, using uh, reactive iron etching, where basically we're using lithography techniques not so displaced from those in your Intel computer chips to form structures on silicon using 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 etching based methods. So these methods aren't cheap. We need some uh, some fairly high quality equipment to be able to replicate these and replicate these well. But what it does give us the possibility is creating really, really high quality microneedle type geometries. So we can get very, very sharp tips on these and very, very good quality uh, microneedles using, using these kinds of techniques. Now, it's not the most cost effective process, but we can mitigate that to a certain extent by being able to make multiple microneedle arrays on a single silicon wafer, which are typically six or eight inches wide. So we can make quite a big area that we can then use as a microneedle patch. Now, the unknowns about silicon are there are doubts about the biocompatibility of silicon, so how it behaves inside the human body. Um, it's also quite a brittle material, so there can be a good chance that silicon will, will fracture during application. Um, and then also, is this process uh, well suited for very, very high volume manufacture? It's an expensive manufacturing process and there's doubts remain on whether or how effectively it could be scaled up for microneedle delivery systems. So another one that was also um, very, very popular in the early days of microneedle study was looking at, at metals for microneedle devices as well. So these can be formed using a range of techniques. You can um, you can machine them using techniques like uh, electro discharge machining, which is a standard kind of tooling technique uh, that's used in many workshops. But by using small wires uh, and low currents that can also be used to make really, really small uh, microneedle devices. Um, or you can use laser machining approaches as well. So you can actually laser machine uh, microneedle upstanding structures by machining the way uh, the material around it. Um, the problem with these techniques is you're removing quite a lot of material to leave just a small needle array. So it's not the most um, 
Uh, it's not the most economical way of making a micro needle array. Um, it takes a long time, and it's you have to have very very accurate machining to 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 machine these arrays effectively. So it's it's let down a little bit by by these these um, these limitations. So another way to uh, that people have approached it is to just take sheet materials, cut out needle structures in that sheet, and then somehow deform those those structures so they're pointing in the outer plane direction and that you that way you can create quite a useful uh, micro needle array um, there may be more prone to bending during insertion which can be can be a slight problem but there are good mechanical properties so the tip uh, the tips um, generally perform well during penetration behavior but once again there are concerns that if you have metal arrays and some element of that breaks off and is left in the skin, what happens to that over time? So once again, um, metal microneedle arrays were very common and popular 10, 15 years ago. These days we're seeing more of a move to, to biocompatible bio polymer materials for, for a range of, of applications. So a very, very popular uh, method of microneedle production so for producing some of the biosolvable or um, dissolvable microneedles that I showed earlier, <coughs> use a technique called polymer casting. So the way polymer casting works is we can take a master that could be our silicon based master from the slide I showed before, where you get these really, really high quality silicon microneedles. And then you can basically cover that in a PDMS, a silicone mold material. So basically by immersing that microneedle array in a PDS, a PDMS mold, let that cure in position and then remove it, you're effectively creating a mold for those microneedle geometries. Now, they won't be replicated with, with absolutely perfect accuracy, but it's usually good enough to be able to then cast a polymer solution into that with your active pharmaceutical if you're using a dissolvable system um, and then you can let that cure in place remove it from the pdms mold which has very very low friction and can deform so the needle array can be released quite easily um, to leave your final micro needle array so this is a really really popular and really really common system for making these arrays in the in the research in the research area and some of the advantages are that you can minimize the amount of material that actually contains uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredient because by controlling the volume dose here you can make sure that you pretty much just about or only fill the cavities in this mold but you can then apply a backing plate onto that that has no active pharmaceutical into it and that minimizes your your uh, your wastage of your drug for the for the given application so um, if the master quality is really good and you get an excellent replication of your PDMS mold, you can get very good uh, needle structures, but it ha you have to be careful with the process and you normally use pressure or vacuum to enable this to occur. Um, as I say, you've got an efficient use of the active ingredient, ingredient as you only need to just fill the needles themselves, then you can apply a backing plate onto that for, for applying to the area. Um, the challenge here is it's a batch process. Uh, and process repeatability can be challenging with the consistency of the molding here and then the second molding stage uh, you might get wear on PDMS molds so do you use them once or do you keep taking them from the master so it's just a bit difficult to to ensure repeatability over high volumes of manufacturing using this particular uh, this particular system um, it's also not yeah, not really well suited for very, very high volume manufacture because you have to, each of these stages takes a finite amount of time. So you'd have to have a massively parallelized operation to get significant volumes of component manufactured in a, in a short period of time. Which brings me to uh, my area, which is the use of ultra precision injection molding methods to actually make these devices, uh, uh, make these devices effectively and in high volumes. So on the left of your screen here, you can see an animation of a Battenfeld microinjection molding machine, where here we have our polymer, normally a thermoplastic, which is at an elevated temperature, so it melts. We feed that into an injection piston here, and that is forced at high pressure into a mold cavity that contains our microneedles, so we can make our microneedle device using this kind of technique. So this is effectively a scaled down industrial polymer processing 
process. I mean, this is the, the effectively the same process that is used to make most of the polymer components that you come across in everyday life. So car bumpers, car wings, car handles, mobile phone cases, all of these kinds of things that you touch and interact with every day are made using injection molding processes. And the reason for that is because they're very economic. They're, they're very efficient. We can make high volumes of components in short periods of time, and we can do that uh, in a very repeatable manner. If your machine is doing the same thing every time and your material is staying consistent, then basically every device you make using this kind of process will be the same as the previous device. So it's what's called a highly repeatable process. Um, so so it's, it's, it's great for making these ultra precision devices. It's not perfect. If we are looking at dissolvable systems, then you imagine we have our API in this in all of this polymer here. By the time we consider our feed system that you can see in this middle, middle picture, so this runner bit is going to be waste material. And even on our uh, microneedle component, uh, we only have the upstanding microneedles in in the center of this disk here. So if we fill this whole component with the API, we're wasting quite a lot of that material. Um, we can overcome this by clever overmolding and minimizing the size of some of these feed systems. But for dissolvable systems, it can be a bit of a, a bit of a problem. We also have to be careful with our drugs themselves. We have to make sure that we're using a polymer, a thermoplastic polymer that melts at a temperature lower than the degradation temperature for the drug. So we can't go to too high temperatures where we would get um, problems with our, with our drug breaking down. So we have to pay particular attention to what materials we're using in the process and make sure that uh, everything is, is unharmed by the processing itself. Because it would be a waste of time if we made our device, but our drug was inactive because we'd exposed it to um, a harsh environment. <coughs> so, if we choose one of these manufacturing processes to make our microneedles, at some point we're going to have to choose an optimized microneedle design to deliver our active pharmaceutical for a particular location on the body. So let's think about what goes in to the selection choices for that microneedle design. So there's a, there's a range of things that we have to look at in order to, in order to um, in order to to make these design choices. So the first one is things like the needle patch density. So in order to deliver a certain amount of drug, what should that density be? How many needles do we need to use in total in order to make sure that that, that payload of drug is delivered to the effective area? And this is then going to affect the, the pitch, so the spacing that we have to use between these needles uh, in order to, to, to define our final patch size is going to be. So this is normally where people start when they look at a particular drug uh, that needs to be applied to, to a certain area. So basically they need to calculate what the payload is going to be and they need to, um, and they need to uh, be able to, 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 to define what the device is going to look like to deliver that payload. Okay. So, um, so basically what you've then got to look at is once you've got a certain number of needles for that, for that design, is what is the force going to be required to, to allow each of those needles to penetrate or that whole array to penetrate into the skin as well. And so to then start to do our force calculations, we need to look at the geometries of the needle itself. So basically we need to look at the needle height. We need to look at the draft angle. We need to work out whether we want a solid or a hollow needle right away, so how that's going to affect the overall design. And they need to look at things like the base width that corresponds with that height and draft angle. <clears throat> but then one of the most important ones is going to be the microneedle tip radius. So this is one of the most challenging, uh, challenging needle design aspects that we need to that we need to address because this is going to affect the fracture of the skin and the fundamental penetration behavior of the microneedle array. So basically, uh, this is one uh, one aspect of the microneedle manufacturing process 
that is the most difficult to achieve. This is where the silicon microneedle arrays provide a good, a good solution to the problem. Uh, but with our injection molding techniques, we can normally get down to a tip radius of the order of three to four microns, which is normally sufficient for, for really good penetration behavior. So this is something that is very much something that needs to be optimized in our manufacturing process. And then finally, once we've come up with, with the, the density of the array and the, the geometry of each of the individual microneedles, we need to then start to think about what the array configuration could look like. So how are these needles laid out? On our, hubs, on our substrate for application to the affected area. So by definition of ball or standard microneedle approaches always seem to assume this kind of square microneedle array with equal spacing between the microneedles um, and this is what most microneedle patches look like. But these choices have only really been made based on the ease of manufacturing. So basically, it's easier to create the arrays using laser systems if you can just use a Cartesian coordinate system. These may not, in fact, actually be the best in terms of penetration behavior and penetration performance, because what you can get is almost like a bed of nails effect with microneedle uh, devices where the stress uh, of the, 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 the skin at the tip of one microneedle can be shielded by the skin being stretched around the microneedles, its neighboring microneedles. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment. We're doing some work at the moment with Cardiff University on understanding this and trying to understand what the optimum shape for these microneedle arrays is going to be. So once we define what shape our microneedles are going to look like, we then need to make the uh, sort of rather challenging uh, choice of what materials we need to use for these microneedles for a given application. So if we're looking at injection molding as a process, we need to look at our material behaviours. So we need to look at mechanical properties like the modulus and the strength of the microneedles, because that's going to basically uh, influence entirely the penetration behaviour of these needles into the skin. We then also got to look at the rheology behavior of these materials in our processes as well. So the rheology is how easily do these materials flow in our molding process? Because if the rheology isn't suitable, we won't get the material to flow into the, into the microneedle cavities. We won't be able to achieve the tip sharpness that we need to ensure the penetration behavior. And so this needs to be considered at an early stage in the design process. We have to make sure as well that when our material has flowed into the mould, that it's able to come out again. It's quite common sometimes with really, really small and sharp microneedle devices that you can have problems with, with material sticking in the tips of the microneedles that causes the microneedles to break as they're released from the mould. So this can be, this can be a, a real challenge. We want needles that have low shrinkage. So as they cool in the mold, they need to retain their shape. So we get that geometry that we require for use. Um, and we may also want to consider things like surface properties in our molding to aid that mold release as well. So basically we can, we can actually coat our molds with diamond like carbon coatings or something like that, that allows us to, to release more easily. And then once we've even uh, gone through these bits, you need to look at other particular uh, elements of your microneedle device that may be important down the line. So what are you going to do with your array? Do you need to join it with another component, in which case the material needs to be compatible with ultrasonic or laser welding techniques? You may want it to be transparent or conductive. If you're looking for a triggered release system that might be light stimulus, or electrical stimulus, then you might have to consider that in your material as well. You've got to look at downstream uh, sterilization techniques as well. So make sure these are compatible with uh, EO or ideally gamma sterilization, so it can all be done in the manufacturing process. Uh, and finally, obviously, you've got to make sure it's got history of use and conforms to all the regulatory um, requirements associated with the end use. And typically in the molding arena, We've been working with polycarbonates, peak liquid crystal polymers as the main uh, materials for mechanically robust devices. And then for bioabsorbable systems, uh, polycaprolactone, polylactic acid, and polylactic code glycolic acids have been the main ones that we've been we've been looking at for our application areas. 
one thing we do have to be conscious of is um, the shear rates that we're exposing these materials to as well. In an injection molding process, we're injecting at quite high velocities. And what this can do is this can cause a breakdown of, of materials in the process. And so what we do is we do quite a lot of work on understanding the shear rates within the process. We could look at the viscosity of the materials at these shear rates, and we can use this information to make sure that we're not gonna cause a breakdown of the polymer or the drug within the polymer caused by excessive heating during the molding process. So we've done a lot of work in this area for optimizing materials based on this kind of information for our application areas, including the dental component that I mentioned before in the, in the early slides. So we do lots of screening tests in the background to make sure that our material and process combination is going to work before we actually start uh, creating the manufacturing process. So other examples here, is that we find that most polymers exhibit a really nice shear thinning behavior. So they actually get e they flow more easily as you inject faster. But then at a certain point, we get this upturn where the polymer stops flowing. We can get significant shear heating and that could cause damage to our active pharmaceutical ingredient. So if we know what shape we want to make our needles, how do we create a mold uh, that allows us to make that shape? Well, we actually use two tooling manufacturing methods here at Bradford. The first one is called electro discharge machining, which is a technique that uses high voltages to burn away steel in order to create the shapes that you want. So this is actually one of our micro needle molds at, at Bradford. And this consists of, uh, of a kind of three sided pyramid type shape micro needle. And this is created by uh, 11 laminates, so 11 strips of metal that have the microneedle form etched into them using electro discharge machining technique. So you can see in the picture on the bottom, we can see our needle forms at the bottom of that, of that laminate there. We assemble this with its partner laminate and then we, we assemble this all together. So all 11 laminate parts into our, into our mold tool and that creates our microneedle array. So it's a very good technique because we can work in hard mold steel straight away, which means we have a tool that could make one million or two million parts before it needs servicing or, or having these laminates replaced. Um, but it is time consuming and it's quite an expensive method. So it's not a development process. It's very much a production manufacturing process for creating these microneedle arrays. Uh, another technique we can use is laser ablation. So we effectively burn our microneedle holes using a very high power short pulse laser. So we work closely with the University of Birmingham on their laser ablation technology for creating these microneedle structures. So by using a scanning technique, we can scan the laser head around our mold insert that goes into our injection molding process. Uh, we can make really accurate uh, shapes in this. So microneedle shapes here, we've got an example which is uh, 900 microns high with a base width of about 400 microns. And we get really good, uh, really good replication of, uh, well, really good creation of these holes to form our microneedle cavities. But the main advantage is it's low cost and it's fast. So this, this six by six array just took 40 minutes. The EDM mold that I showed on the previous slide took about a month to machine every single um, every single laminate to form that, that tool, which is clearly much more expensive as a solution. So laser machining is, is great. It, it's fast and low cost. The problem is it maybe doesn't offer exactly the same level of surface quality as the EDM technique. So you see here we have a slightly rougher surface finish, but for a majority of applications, it works very well indeed. OK, so we've designed we've decided what microneedle shape we would like to make. Uh, we've decided what material we want to make it from and how we're going to make our mold tool. The next thing we want to look at is to satisfy the regulatory bodies. How do we ensure that our process, our manufacturing process is in control and is making products of the required quality? Uh, and, and repeatability. So what we do on our machines is we use extensive process analytics. So we use a range of extra sensors on the machine to measure uh, injection rates, we measure injection pressures, we measure temperatures, we measure all aspects of the movement of the machine uh, to monitor the process. And what we can do is we can provide alarms 
if we see significant deviations in any of these measurements from cycle to cycle that could indicate that something has failed in the process or we have problems with our, our raw materials or, or something that could affect the overall quality of, of the part. So we can use these, these aspects of our, of our manufacturing process as product quality indicators. So what we can effectively do is on the right here, I have an example of some of the uh, process data that we can collect from the injection molding process. So we have uh, injection pressures. So you can see on the, uh, the green line here is our injection pressure. So this gradually increases as our cavity fills. And then we get a peak just before the cavity fills completely. And then that drops down to what we call the hold pressure. So we just sustain the pressure on that part to, uh, to compensate for shrinkage as the material starts to cool. But then we can also measure the uh, infrared temperature of the surface of the component. So this blue line here, we can measure the surface temperature of the part. And we can also measure the cavity pressure. So the pressure inside the mold cavity itself is shown in the yellow line here. So we could look at peak values from each of these um, each of these process data. We could look at integrals under the curve at various locations here. And we can correlate that with actual physical properties of the microneedles. So we can look at the height of the microneedle, as we're showing here, or the tip radius of the microneedle. So in set one, we've got less favorable manufacturing process conditions, which gives us a, 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 a shorter microneedle, it has a lower height. And of course, because it's lower height, the material isn't penetrating so much into the tip, so we have a larger tip radius. So what we can do is we can correlate these fundamental uh, product quality parameters from the microneedle array and correlate them with the process data itself. So what that means is by monitoring the process data on the machine, we can ensure that we keep an, an accurate um, tracker on the quality of the microneedle arrays that we're producing, assuming this, this um, statistical link between the two is robust enough. So then we can take that data and what we're working on now is what's called an industry 4.0 system where we're looking at full automation of manufacturing processes also involving artificial intelligence to make decisions which could lead to intelligent process control so the ability to make modifications uh, within the um, the machine operating window to take into account any local disturbances or variations that could impact on our our quality assurance of the part Okay, so coming to the end of the talk, so now we're looking at how we actually assess the quality of the microneedle for its intended use. So how do we measure uh, the quality of the microneedle array and how do we assess it uh, for its intended uh, use of, of administering these, these drugs? So we use a range of techniques at Bradford. Uh, one of the first ones we can do is we can look at uh, laser scanning confocal microscopy which allows us to build a 3D profile that represents the microneedle array that we've manufactured in our processes. So you can see here, this was captured using our Olympus Lex, uh, 3000, or Lex 4000 uh, 3D scanning uh, confocal microscope. And here we can see a nice consistency across the array. We can measure the heights and the tip radius of each needle on the array as well. If we want to investigate it with even more resolution, we can place one of these on an atomic force microscope and we can get a very, very accurate measurement of the, the surface structure at the tip and we can look at the, 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 tip, the tip geometry. But this is generally um, overkill, really. We don't need to measure with this level of accuracy for the majority of our microneedles. We also have um, a micro CT system. So this allows us to volumetrically measure uh, our, our microneedle arrays. So if we have a drug crystalline solid within our microneedle arrays that has a significant change in density from our poly polymer carrier, we can use the micro CT to look at the distribution of that drug within our microneedle arrays. So it provides this this volumetric imaging uh, imaging behavior that allows us to investigate in more detail. In fact, we can go one stage on from that and we can look at synchrotron CT analysis. So this was one of our microneedle arrays that was measured by uh, Professor Zhu and Zhang in Simcas in China. So this is once again a full volumetric measurement of the microneedle device. 
then we can use this to measure geometry and uh, drug consistency within the device um, for, for our, uh, our sharp microneedle device. So this is a device that was actually manufactured using the laminate-based mold tool. So you can actually see the split planes uh, where the laminates uh, uh, neighbor each other. So we have this slight line that you can see clearly on the measurement that we've taken here. So with the CT analysis, we can get accurate measurements of each of the needles. We can look at tip radii and we can, uh, and we can compare that with, uh, with what our design um, aspirations were. So we can make sure that we're making something that was as we'd expected it to be. However, these are all really advanced offline measurement systems. So these, these, these methods are very, very accurate. We can learn a lot about our microneedle arrays, but they're not practical for a real manufacturing process. Um, they take too long. Basically, to measure a microneedle array using one of these systems is going to take uh, tens of minutes or hours. When, and what we need is something that sits within our manufacturing system and can measure every few seconds. So we've explored this. We made a bespoke measurement system using a telecentric illuminator and a telecentric microscope objective to, to, to measure each of the needles on a 10 by 10 microneedle array. So the way this works is we have our array at a slight angle and it's on an X and a Y stage here that traverses around the microneedle array, bringing a needle into focus at a particular time. And once it's in focus, we fit uh, an edge to uh, between the, the dark and the, the bright pixels. And then we can use that to measure the height of the microneedle and also the, um, the sharpness of the tip. So this is still, it's fairly low cost system. Um, it probably takes a minute running at its fastest speed to take a full scan. So it's still not fast enough to keep up with the full manufacturing process, but it does allow us to monitor the quality of needles during a production batch. We're just currently working on, on, on making a faster version of this, but we're still not going to get down to the requirements of making a measurement in less than four seconds to keep up with the process. I can actually show the system in use here. So here you can see we're, we're moving around from microneedle tip to microneedle tip on the array. And at each point, we're getting a measurement of the height of the microneedle and the tip radius here in microns of each microneedle in the array. So purely, purely using the fact that the, um, the microscope objective has a very low depth of field, which allows us to individually identify each microneedle in this array. And by traversing from needle to needle, we're able to build up um, a full uh, representation of, of the microneedle array or the, the microneedle quality within the array. So these dots here, green means that the, the quality is uh, is okay in terms of the height and, and the radius of the of the needle. So finally, once we've made our micro needle array and that we've checked that it conforms to the geometrical specification that we originally came up with, we need to start thinking about introducing our active ingredients onto that array. So what we if if we've not gone for a absorbable material or dissolvable material, we need to think about how we get our active ingredient onto those microneedle tips. So I'm just going to discuss coating methods in the next bit. Now, one of the challenges we have with coating any microneedle array is the fact that the surface energy of the polymers is very low. So basically, things don't want to stick to them, so it's difficult to get coatings to attach. So what we've worked on over many years now is treatments to improve the surface energy prior to coating. And we generally just use an industry standard for many polymer components, which is plasma surface treatment. So it's a common method employed in industry for attaching labels or adhesives uh, to, to, to plastics. So just to give an example of how uh, it can improve the contact angle, this was uh, an example where we wanted to coat a peak microneedle array. Um, so what we did was we looked that contact angle measurements before and after oxygen plasma treatment. And you can see that after 30 minutes of plasma treatment, we get significant improvements in, uh, in the contact angle, significant increase in surface energy. So we're able to get things to, to stick more easily to these surfaces. So what we did was we did our, uh, uh, our treating 
on some peak specimens. So basically, we measured the increase in surface, <coughs> increase in surface energy and the increase in surface roughness. We got a corresponding increase in surface roughness, which once again improved the ability of a coating to adhere to the to the surface. And we did a test with a simple uh, BSA solution to see how well the BSA could absorb onto the surface for both a um, a plasma treated and a non plasma treated surface. And as you can see here on the left is a non plasma treated surface where we have a rather, a rather sparse coating of our BSA solution. And then on the right, we get a really good covering of the BSA when the plasma treatment is present. So what we thought we'd do is we confirm that with a measurement, uh, a dissolution measurement. So we took our microneedle array, we put it into our dip coating system. So this is a, a system that uses an optical technique for measuring the microneedle tip relative to the, um, the surface of the solution. And we use that to lower down using a very high precision drive. We enable that to dwell inside the solution for a given length of time, and then it retracts for the coating to, to dry uh, in situ. So this gives us a really repeatable way of controlling the dose on our, on our microneedle tips. So we took our coated array, and we did a, uh, a permeation sort of measurement. So basically, we used uh, porcine skin models. We punched our array through the porcine skin and we used a sampling system to HPLC to look at the concentration of BSA that permeated through the skin with time. And we found that when we compare the, um, the plasma treated um, array compared to the untreated array, we got a significantly higher payload of material uh, coming off the plasma treated. So we were, able to, we were able to achieve a better coating performance by using the plasma treatment for this particular application. And I've briefly hinted at uh, penetration tests. So we do lots of work with uh, porcine models for looking at the penetration behavior on various microneedle arrays. So what we would generally do with a new uh, microneedle geometry is we use a nano indenter with a flat punch on there to investigate the microneedle buckling behavior. So basically what we can do is we can compress each microneedle in an array. We can take force measurements from that and we can look at the nature of the failure of the microneedle. So make sure it doesn't fracture and then get left in the skin. And with polymer microneedles, we generally see um, a very good uh, behavior. They tend, to, they tend to deform in a highly ductile manner, which means we wouldn't be seeing, uh, we would be unlikely to see broken needles in the skin during use. So once we've verified how the materials uh, buckle, we then want to do tests in our porcine models. So we, um, we very uh, early on in the process realized that actually the penetration behavior into skin is hugely dependent on the condition of the skin and also the tension within the skin. So if you look at anyone uh, who's, uh, who you want to apply a microneedle treatment to, the skin is, is, is very different depending on the body location. So obviously you know, the skin on your upper arm or your thigh, it behaves much more differently to the skin on your ankle or somewhere where you don't have the same level of, of, of uh, underlayer material. Um, age significantly affects, affects the mechanical properties of skin, ethnicity, the amount of hydration you have, hormonal changes, they can all affect skin tension and the consistency of a substrate underneath your skin. And we need to take that into account during our penetration tests. So what we've done is we've designed a skin tensioning apparatus that just uses a stepper motor uh, and a range of, of, of drive wheels to uniformly stretch the skin uh, to different levels. And then what we can also do is we can apply various hydrated substrates underneath this and then we can perform tests to ensure that we're mimicking human skin behavior prior to our penetration tests. We can then place our microneedle array in place of the probe here, and we can perform penetration studies to make sure we get adequate penetration performance. But this, this is vitally important because if you just, um, if you just peg uh, your porcine skin models out onto a, uh, onto a uniformly hard substrate, you probably encounter much better penetration behavior 
than you would expect to see on a real person simply because it's so well supported that the needles just have to go in there. So mimicking real human skin is really important for doing these kinds of tests. So from doing that, what we can do is we can measure the insertion force required for each needle in the array by doing single needle, needle tests or the array as a whole to make sure the total force required isn't going to be uh, higher than that that is capable of applying with a given applicated kind of system. So we do lots of work on, on quantifying insertion force required. And this is particularly important for the larger arrays where you're trying to give quite a high dosage of drug uh, in a given application. And finally, once we've done the penetration tests, we can use techniques such as optical coherence tomography to image the microneedle device within the skin. So we can do this uh, not quite real time, but, but pretty quickly. So we can actually look at the deformation with time uh, and then we can sort of correlate needle penetration behavior within the skin uh, at, at given times during the, uh, during the application. So on the right hand side here, you can see the kind of needle structure, the needle form. As it, uh, as it progresses in the skin. So we can actually measure the, the depth of penetration. We can see how well it's gone in there. And with dissolvable systems, you can see how they decay over time too. So it's quite a useful technique for monitoring our penetration performance. Okay, and the last thing I'm gonna talk about is actually we've gone through uh, the process for, uh, for designing and, and making these microneedles, but there's also a big opportunity now for doing virtual design work in advance of making tools or, or doing tests on your microneedle devices. So we're looking at uh, a lot of uh, activities for computer modeling, for not only predicting the microneedle performance and the behavior, but also how we can actually use these tools to optimize our manufacturing processes as well. So, Finite element analysis of penetration behavior is a, a, a still in its infancy, uh, but it's the emerging field. Um, and the reason for this is finite element analysis methods are, are very, very common for looking at uh, metals, polymers, the component performance in given environments. Um, any modern car will be modeled entirely using finite element analysis to ensure uh, the, the mechanical performance before any tooling or, or prototypes have been made. For microneedle applications though, it's a little bit more complicated because the model accuracy is hugely dependent on good quality material data for the behavior of skin um, and underlying layers in order to get an accurate solution. Uh, we also need to look at really good quality meshing strategies as well. So here we've got an example of a mesh um, uh, for a microneedle going into uh, various layers of skin. Now, at some point, the skin is going to fracture, so we need to kind of recreate the mesh to take that into account. We've got a separation of this material here. So there's all sorts of various numerical um, uh, sorcery that we have to do to ensure that we get an accurate solution to our model. But there is ongoing work. We're doing lots of close work validating some of these methods with, with Cardiff University. Um, and we're getting somewhere now where we can move from single needle systems to, uh, to much larger scale arrays to get a better understanding of this penetration behavior. But this is a, this is a very useful tool for, for looking at the forces required, but also predicting the skin deformation during the application because this can inform about applicator design in order to kind of pre-stretch or pre-tension the skin and ensure you get a very good quality replication performance, uh, penetration performance. So that's, that's understanding the needle penetration behavior. What we can do much more readily at the moment is predict uh, how well we can actually make these needle arrays by using flow simulation tools. So we can design our microneedle component. We can then basically virtually recreate our injection molding process by choosing uh, the right material and the recommended sort of um, process um, parameters in order to see whether we can accurately fill these microneedle arrays using, uh, using these kinds of software packages. So an example here, we've got this five times five array that we've been looking at throughout the presentation. We can apply all the material properties of the material we hope to use and the um, and the process conditions that we would expect 
we can run that simulation and that will tell us what we'd expect to see in terms of the thermal conditions of the mole tool. So we can model uh, the thermal evolution uh, of the mole tool and work out when that's going to reach steady state. So when we can start to, to collect real uh, components from our, from our manufacturing process. And we can also then see the filling performance for the microneedles as well. So we can see what's going to happen as the polymer is injected under pressure into the mold cavity. And we can look at the, the filling of each of the microneedles and just make sure that we don't get any defects at the tip of the microneedles or part filling that's going to affect our, our needle sharpness and our penetration performance. OK, so I think to summarise uh, summarize the talk, um, basically rather than just write loads of words again, um, the key thing here is microneedles are an incredibly exciting technology for addressing lots of uh, of issues we have with drug and vaccine delivery and the ways of ways of overcoming some of the limitations we have uh, with with the uh, with the administration of these drugs. Uh, however, it's an incredibly complex field, and uh, in order to create um, a workable uh, microneedle based drug delivery system, we need to have a massive kind of uh, interdisciplinary collaboration and cooperation between. Uh, uh, the pharmaceutical experts, the engineering experts, the characterization experts to ensure that we've got a viable, a viable system to take forwards. So what we talked about today ranges all the way from polymer selection through microneedle design, manufacturing processes, all the way through to the final characterization methods and validation methods that you're going to require to pass your regulatory processes. So we need to consider all of those together um, in order to, to get to where we need to be with these devices. But what we've done over the past 10 years or so is shown how well we can work together with these disparate groups to create things that, that make a real difference. OK, so thank you. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the team back in Bradford uh, for, for their work and their help with this project. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, if anybody's got any questions for me. Thank you, sir. That was indeed an enlightening session on microneedles and their applications. I would now like to request Dr. Rita Lala to briefly summarize the session and conduct a question answer round. Thank you, sir, for that scintillating deliberation. We are all so much in awe of the enormity of the research area that you and your team are working on, especially in areas of health care for better outcomes. You have so very lucidly explained and elaborated on all aspects of microneedles, right from its basics to applications, their viable use, especially in the current corona pandemic. You have stressed on the significant benefits vis-a-vis -vis other dosage forms. You have so effectively detailed on the various types of microneedles, their application techniques, and highlighted the application consistency issues with material requirements, processes of manufacture, tool manufacturing methods, coating methods, testing methods, computer modeling, and process assurance to satisfy regulatory bodies. We really hope that the microneedle manufacturing technique developed by you, a large scale production of COVID vaccines, which is the need of the arm. So with your kind permission, can we take some questions? Yeah, sure. The first question has been posted in the chat box by Dr. Gauri Dikshit. And uh, she asks how to calculate the drug loading. How to calculate the drug loading? Right, OK, per microneedle. Well, it's it's going to depend on which microneedle design that you take. Uh, but basically what we normally do, for, say for a dissolvable microneedle, we would typically work at about a 50 50 carrier to active uh, ratio in the microneedle. 
So then to calculate the drug loading for that, we would just work out the volume of each microneedle from the geometry of the microneedle. Uh, because we know that 50% of that is going to be the API, we can then calculate for the number of microneedles on the array what the total drug loading is going to be. So it's just it's just a case of, of calculating from, from the percentage of your drug in the material by working out the total volume of the of the array will we'll tell you what your drug loading is going to be. If that oh, makes sense. Oh, okay. Yeah. So can we go ahead? Okay. Can we go yeah. ahead, sir? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Amarjit Singh Rajput. Uh, and it goes as please throw light on peak polymers. P E E K polymers. Peak polymers. So peak peak are um, one of the best thermoplastics uh, in terms of mechanical properties. So they are uh, they they are low friction. They use for bearing surfaces, but they also have extensive use uh, for uh, implants in the body. They are very um, they're very good for use inside the body. They're very biocompatible. But they also have excellent mechanical properties that with certain processing can approach the, the kind of stiffness uh, and the and the well, modulus of, of bone type materials. So so it's a very high performance uh, polymer, but it's also uh, very suitable for implants and uh, and uh, fixations within the body as well. So so we use it because of its good uh, mechanical properties. Uh, and its biocompatibility, it seems ideal for, for a, a microneedle device. We know that it's not going to fracture in use and it's got a, a good a good modulus, so it's not going to bend or deform during the application as well. Thank you, sir. So the next question is also by Dr. Rajput and he asks, what is the method to decide microneedle array whether 10 by 10 or 15 by 15, et cetera. That's entirely due to the, um, the amount of drug that you wish to administer. So basically, we can only achieve a certain drug content in each needle. So the array size is really determined by the amount of drug that, that we want to deliver to an area. So ideally, we want to keep the array size as small as possible because that requires a low force to administer. And also, um, Sometimes with with the with the human body, there's no very flat area of your skin. You, everything's like your arms are like cylinders. So so locally, um, your skin, although if you push down on it, it flattens. Um, you ideally want to keep the array as small as possible, so you don't have problems with the curvature of the skin affecting the uh, the application of the microneedle array. So this is why things like the upper arm are popular, but also the thigh is good because you've got quite a low amount of curvature for applying the microneedle device. But yeah, the array size is normally entirely determined by the payload of the drug that you wish to deliver. And that's why we can sometimes see quite large arrays for, for, uh, for where we need to deliver quite a, li a large volume of drug. Thank you, sir. So we have a question from Suparna Bakli requesting you to elaborate on vaccine delivery through microneedles. Vaccine delivery, okay. Right. I'm an engineer, I'm not an expert on uh, antigens and that kind of thing. But basically, um, vaccine delivery is, is one of the ideally suited uh, application areas for microneedles, simply because we need quite a low amount of the antigen to trigger the kind of uh, the immune response. But also, um, with a microneedle device, we're putting it in the right part of the body to get uh, a very good kind of immuno response and a good kind of um, cascade to the response for for against the against the antigen. So, what um, colleagues, uh, pharmaceutical colleagues, have seen is that in many cases you can get uh, a very successful vaccination that doesn't require like a, a booster, a booster shot, or or a follow on application for some combinations of, of vaccines. But basically, by putting the vaccine in the target area, you're able to get a uh, much more higher efficacy, so you need uh, less amount of antigen um, and and you, you have really, really good outcomes. But as I say, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not I'm not uh, 
uh, an expert in the area, but that's that's what uh, that's what uh, my partners tell me. Thank you, sir. So the next question is by Harsha Katpalia. How is free energy measured? Surface free energy, how is it measured? Oh, right, OK. Um, so what we do is we, we, we do a range of droplet tests with uh, different liquids of different, en uh, different energies. And then we use the Owens Wendt theory to calculate uh, the, the, the free energy from, from that calculation. We fit a line to, we're going back to the detail now, so we fit a gradient to the various points on there and from uh, that gradient we can calculate the various parameters that, that tell us what the, what the free energy is going to be. But so generally, gen generally we're using just the, the contact angle measurements as an indicator of the, of the surface energy of the material and we correlate that with the success of our, um, of our coating. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Alifia Larry, who's right here, uh, she has asked what are some prerequisite properties a formulation must possess to enable drug delivery through microneedles? Right, okay. So, if, if you're formulating a dissolvable system, then the prerequisites for the formulation should be uh, with a focus on your uh, your release time. I mean, we've we've created formulations that release very quickly, but will also remain in the body. Some will remain in the body to six months after after insertion. So so basically, you need to formulate based on the, the the fundamental kind of therapeutic release profile that you want for for your for your active ingredient. But the challenge is as well that you've got. Uh, the other problem, which is making sure that your formulation has the required mechanical properties to make it function as an actual needle itself as well. So you've got these these kind of competing uh, properties of the the kind of the, the, the dissolution parameters or the, the parameters of the breakdown of the material and the mechanical properties of, of the micro needle device as well. So this can prove can prove quite challenging from a formulation perspective which is why we see kind of coated systems, sometimes a variation on the coated system also a little reservoir of material at the tip of the microneedle where you can support your formulation with a much more rigid um, engineering polymer, so a mechanically sound polymer, um, which, which performs the, 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 uh, the penetration and then your formulation can be released in the body uh, following, following the application. So formulation is, is a real challenge. That's why we have good conversations with our uh, um, with our pharmaceutical engineering team to tweak those formulations to control release rates, but also make sure that they're uh, relevant for, for this particular application technique as well. Thank you, sir. So the next question is by Bebavi Pishativar. Which substances are most suitable for delivery through microneedles? Which substances? What um, active? Which active ingredients? I mean, yeah, I'll say, so it seems to yeah, be I mean, uh, active ingredients. Right. Okay. So oh, oh, there's a there's a whole list. So right. So there's a whole range of different treatments. Um, so examples we've had. Um, we had, there's a really nice example by one of my colleagues um, over in uh, Northern Ireland, Belfast, where there's uh, a particular condition uh, that requires you to get high volumes of drugs into the lymphatic system. So I think the standard technique is to take a significant amount of oral drugs in order to address, uh, it's like an elephantitis type condition. It's like a, it treats um, a parasites that gets into your lymphatic system. But if you take oral drugs, um, by the time it's reached the, the lymphatic site, um, the, 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 the drug payload is so decreased that it, it's not really, uh, it doesn't offer a significant therapeutic advantage. However, the same treatment when delivered by a microneedles technique because you're delivering it pretty much in the lymphatic system area then the therapy can be can be much more intense and much more much more pronounced so anywhere where you want to target the lymphatic system or the immune system then the microneedle delivery is ideal for delivering that kind of that kind of, of drug basically 
So, so anything where you get significant benefits over an oral system like that would be would be suitable for that kind of thing. The other thing that is that it, you need to consider for microneedle delivery is once again being being careful to look at how much drug you need to deliver in in the amount of time because if the payload required is so much that you're requiring a really large microneedle array or you're needing to apply it too many times per day then it becomes unfeasible uh, but apart from that you are avoiding all the problems with patches with uh, large molecule drugs because large molecule drugs will, will happily be delivered using using microneedle therapy um, so yeah, there's, there's there's a range of different application areas. You just have to think about which are more suited for delivery in this part of the body. Other things as well that are useful are things like um, um, sort of local anaesthetics, that kind of thing. We can we can administer that quite effectively with a microneedle device as well. Anywhere where you need to get it close to the to the point of use, microneedle devices are going to be useful for for those kinds of applications. Thank you, sir. I can see one more question and it is by Hina Bhujwani. What do you think of the application of micro needles for the transpapillary route of delivery for breast cancer? Will they be feasible for this type of delivery? Ooh, um, mm. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I'm not so familiar with the treatment, to be honest. Um, what I'd be happy to do is, if you'd like to share my email address, I can uh, I can actually take that question and share it with uh, with my colleagues who work who work closer in these kinds of areas. But yes, unfortunately, as an engineer, I'm not familiar with with treatments for that. I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Sure, sir. We'll do that. We will share your email so that. Uh, uh, she can reach out to you and the question can then be addressed. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Vandana Panda, faculty from our college has asked, can micro delivery cause serious inflammatory reactions? Um, no, I mean, generally there seem to be uh, microneedle delivery is generally better than hypodermic delivery um, for 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 that very reason. Um, occasionally, you can get a slight a slight reaction, um, but that's normally with longer microneedle devices that seem to penetrate deeper into the skin. So by choosing by choosing the microneedle length carefully for the skin application area, you can generally avoid these these kind of serious serious reactions. Um, it's um, it's it's one of the, the selling points of the microneedle technology, but I'm not saying they don't happen. Occasionally, you can you can get um, a small inflammatory response, but it's not you wouldn't call it a serious inflammatory response. Just a small uh, a small amount of discomfort occasionally. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mrinal. Have I missed any question? Please, can you Alifia? Please, can you check on that? There don't seem to be any further questions for the moment. Oh no, Dr. Rita, I don't I don't think you have missed any question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for addressing our queries and giving us your guidance. As we approach the end of today's session, I'd like to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of Principal KM Kundnani, College of Pharmacy. I'd like to ext extend our gratitude to our dignitary, Mr. Kishu Mansukhani, our keynote speaker, Professor Paratkar, our speakers, Dr. Sadhana, and Professor Benjamin Whiteside for enriching our program with their informative sessions. A big thank you to our principal, Dr. Urmila Joshi, coordinator, Dr. Mrinal Sanaye, and the chairpersons, Dr. Swati Patil and Dr. Rita Lala, for their efforts in organizing and conducting the event. Lastly, a big thank you to all the attendees who are an integral part of today's program. Thank you one and all. The link for tomorrow's program will be shared with you and the program for tomorrow begins at 9 a.m. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks a lot. Your session was really interactive and it's an honor to have you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.